As you guys are finding your seats, I want to welcome you again to Christ Center. My name is Jason. I'm the associate pastor here. Some call me the associate to the pastor. Some of you got that. I especially want to welcome those who, identi- who, who are here because someone you love asked you to be here, <laughs> but you don't necessarily identify as religious or spiritual, I really want to say welcome to you guys. I think it takes a lot of maturity to be able to step into a place where it seems everyone else believes something you don't. So thank you for being here and welcome. That's very cool. Um, and welcome to some of you guys I haven't seen in a while. It's just great. It's great to be together. Uh, before I begin, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. Uh, this is Catherine McNeil. This one. This is my wife, but you know her. <laughs> This is Catherine McNeil. For the past year, Catherine and I have been writing a book together <laughs> over Zoom because she lives in Chicago. We kept having to restart the Zoom meetings because we had the 40-minute limit. I probably did that about 200 times. Uh, she flew out here from Chicago with her husband, Matthew, and their, and their family. It's been great to meet them and hang out. Um, we, uh, this is kind of a special day. They, they, they flew out not here to be with us but to hang out with family over spring break in Washington. And it turns out the cheapest flight back was through Eugene, which is wild. So they're here. And also today's a special day because today is, is the day we have to hit send on our manuscript. So isn't that cool the way that all worked out? It's pretty fun. Anyway, I asked Catherine to, uh, to read our scripture this morning. Rather than read out of a traditional translation, we are going to read out of uh, a paraphrase called The Message by Eugene Peterson, which was published by... The good folks at NAP Press. NAP Press. Are we on? We're not on. Now we're on. NAP Press. There we go. All right, Catherine, let's do this thing. All right, thank you, Jason. This is from Luke 24, 13 through 21 in the message. That same day, two of the disciples were walking to the village, Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, what's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there, long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name was Cleopas, said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened during the last few days? He said, what has happened? They said, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, he was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. Thank you, Catherine. You can give that back to that man in the suit. (laughs) Last year, uh, I watched a a TV show. It was a reality show of sorts about a guy who got drafted for jury duty. Some of you guys saw the show. The cameras followed him everywhere from the moment he stepped into the waiting room to the uh, pre-trial hearings when he got chosen, and then all the way through this trial, which was an absolute train wreck. The jury got sequestered, even though it was a civil suit. It lasted for like three weeks, and everything that could go wrong in this trial went wrong. It was madness. And at the very end of the trial, after things had been settled, the judge looks over to the jury, and particularly at this man who was the foreperson, and here's what he says. He says, I told you before that this was my last trial, but I didn't tell you that this was my first trial. I'm an actor. And uh, the lawyers are actors, and the defendant is an actor. In fact, Mr. Foreperson Every other jury member is an actor. And this poor guy's eyes are about to pop out of his head because he thought he was living one story and it turned out he was living another one. These two men in the chapter, in the passage we just read, are about to have that same kind of epiphany. The story they thought they were living was not the one they actually we're living. But before we get there, we need to like meet these men, okay? The two travel, well, there's Jesus is there, and we'll, we'll get back to him. The two travelers are known as disciples, disciples of Jesus. 
Now, we're not talking about member of, members of Jesus 12, the inner circle. This was probably maybe a second layer back of the 70 followers who, who were with him. We don't know for sure. We only know one of their names, Cleopas. Now, I went, I thought that's, that's a little cumbersome to only have one of their names, so I went to some of our best scholars, the children, on Wednesday night and said, I need another name for this disciple, the second one. And Adele Oaks said, Garfield. <laughs> Hence, we have Cleopas and Garfield for the rest of the morning. Now, a disciple, in case you're wondering, just means a student. He was a student who followed and imitated a particular rabbi. Uh, they, were, they were like apprentices in an internship, doing their best to, to listen to and, and live like their master Jesus. And so far, guys, it had been a pretty awesome internship. This guy, this, this guy Jesus was different. He was just different. The way he spoke was different. The things he taught were different. For example, he, he, he de-emphasized things like religious rituals. He, he told one group he, on the Sermon on the Mount to stop praying publicly because because that can become performative, and it was becoming performative, and it, it, is, it, it happens often. And, and relationship with Jesus, or with God, is, is not a performance. In fact, when Jesus spoke of God, he spoke with jarringly familiar terms, calling him Father. This was not a performance. And when he spoke, he spoke about all of life, not just religious life. Things like dealing with your enemies, instead of nearly merely putting up with them, uh, having tolerance for them. He says to love your enemies, to go the extra mile for those who have been outsiders in your life. Teachings like this made Jesus at once both a rock star and a villain. Yeah, a rock star because, come to find out, people actually en enjoy being treated with love and respect. It's shocking, I know. But it made him a villain because a lot of what he was saying was flying in the face of all the conventional norms, especially in the religious world of the day. But it wasn't just the way Jesus talked. It was like he actually lived these things. All right, he, he repeatedly, routinely hung out with people who would have been considered his, his, his enemies. I mean, not only was he hanging out with people with sketchy reputations, but also with people the religious people who were literally plotting against him. How's that for loving your enemy? He spoke differently, too. He, he spoke differently. He lived differently. And then there were the miracles. Like these apprentices had followed him, uh, and they'd seen some wild stuff, you guys. They, they saw lepers cleansed. They saw withered hands straightened. They saw blind eyes opened. It had been a show. <laughs> and most recently, they had seen their friend Lazarus, who had been dead for days, in a tomb. They, they, they witnessed him come out of his tomb when Jesus woke him up. It had been some kind of awesome internship for Cleopas and Garfield. Until it suddenly wasn't. You see, the, the, the week before had been a nightmare. I mean, it started out really cool, like what we call Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and was met with all of, he was met with all his Jesus stands. There you go, Gen Z. My son hates it when I use Gen Z terms, like stands. All, Jesus had gone viral, and everybody wanted a piece of him, everybody wanted to see him, and as they met him coming into Jerusalem, they were cheering, they were waving palm branches, which was like their, almost like their, their national flag, and they were, they were yelling, Hosanna in the highest, save us, they, they were, it was like a coronation, they were treating him like a king, and that was a dangerous thing, because all the Roman soldiers are standing there going, um, we're stationed here to quell moments like this. It was nearly a riot. But if you are one of Jesus' followers, it was electric. They were so excited to see it. And I suspect that Cleopas and Garfield had gotten very much into this moment as well. It was awesome. And I, I suspect 
that they followed him and continued to, to soak in the environment as Jesus goes into the city, as, as he, he goes into the temple and he flips over tables and chases out the grifters. As he speaks these incredibly wise words and people are drawn to him, as, as he continues to, to, to uh, heal the sick and welcome the children, his magnetism, everything that was there, they're right with them and it's so awesome to watch him amaze the crowds with his wisdom and his kindness and his power. And then, just when his popularity had reached his pinnacle, and I'm sure many of his followers were expecting him to call everybody together and let's do this thing, he disappears. He disappears for a couple days and doesn't show up again until Friday morning. And now, he didn't look at all like a king except for the mock crown that he wore made out of sharp thorns. And he's bleeding from his head, he's bleeding from his back, he's bleeding from his face. He had been tortured. And for the next several hours, the Roman soldiers continued to torture him. They announced he would be crucified on a Roman cross, and they forced him to carry the instrument of his own execution all the way up this hill. He couldn't do it. Had to have somebody else do it. They get to the top of the hill. They lay him down and they nail him to the cross and they lift him up for the whole of Jerusalem to see. And the message was clear. This man is not who you hoped he would be. He's not a savior and he's not a king. And he dies that afternoon. And so Cleopas and Garfield and the rest of Jerusalem watch him die. And that's how the feast ends. It's a massive, massive letdown. And now all the thousands and thousands of travelers questioning and probably a lot of silence. And in the middle of that conversation, a stranger joins these two. And he's wearing a fake mustache. They do not recognize Jesus of Nazareth. We don't know why. That is my best guess. It's there in the Greek, the deep, deep Greek. He slides into the conversation. Hey, guys, why the sad faces? And they're like, they can't believe that anybody who had just come from the city doesn't know because everybody knows. And they're like, man, it's such a bummer. There's Jesus, he's a man of God, he's a prophet. And the leaders betrayed him and crucified him. And man, we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Oh, friends, they had hopes. They had so many hopes. But their hopes had been brittle and they shattered. And the story they most believed in was over. I think each of us has a story we most believe in a narrative that we like most align our lives to. Whether we recognize it or not. And I think most of them start out in similar ways, you know, like in the beginning, in the beginning of our lives, like we have hopes and dreams. We have, this is the way life is going to turn out. But invariably, something happens, something tragic happens, something very, very hard. And this thing that was supposed to be beautiful is broken, it's dashed. And I think we all sense this after a little bit of life. I'm sure you felt that too, that life was supposed to be different than it is. Better than it is. You've seen your loved ones suffer from disease. You yourself have suffered. There's been grief. And then you, in your news feeds, you see even more extreme grief, violence and wars and hatred. And even if we can't quite identify why it's so unjust, because it's been like this forever, even if we can't identify why we know inherently that it is, that things were supposed to be different, that's what our friend Cleopas and Garfield (laughs) knew as well. He's grieving his loss here. He says, we had hopes that Jesus was the one to deliver Israel. And in his statement... What I see is I, I, I think these men thought that their story of brokenness was going to be resolved in a certain way. You see, this is where our stories splinter off. How, do you, how are they resolved? How is this resolved? And for them, it was with the redemption of their nation. 
And in all likelihood, they, they believed just like the crowd had. I say that based on his statement. Just like the crowd had. That this miracle-working rabbi was going to use his power of celebrity and magic to, to restore independence to their nation and overthrow the empire. The solution was all about political power. That's the narrative they saw themselves in. They were a part of this man's dedicated following, and together they would use violence to overcome the violence. That was the plot they had committed themselves to, but now their hero was dead and the story broke. Let's pick it back up. Luke 24, verse 21. We had our hopes that he was the one, the one to, about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened. But now, some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They, they came back with the story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it was empty, just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. They're very confused here. Understandably, this was quite a curveball. Evidently, someone had stolen Jesus' body or something, and the women, starting with Mary Magdalene, had apparently like, lost their minds because like, people don't come back from the dead. It's just, it's just not done. Even back then, before science was invented, people didn't come back from the dead. So it's very strange. Like, What hope is there? But here's Jesus, who has, in fact, come back from the dead, and he's playing with the ends of his fake mustache listening very quietly, mm, 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 I understand, yes. And finally, he can't take it anymore. He's like, ah! Ugh! He doesn't rip it off. He thinks about it. He says to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophets said? Don't you see that these things had to happen? That the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. And they came to the edge of the village where they were headed. He acted as if he were going to keep going, but they pressed him, stay stay for supper with us, it's it's nearly evening, The, the, the day is done. So he went in with them and here's what happened. He sat down at the table with them and taking the bread, he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And at that moment, open-eyed and wide-eyed, they recognized him. And then he disappeared. This was the moment of revelation. It's the moment of truth when the story they thought they were living they discovered was not the real story. They thought they were living in a different genre. They thought they were living in a political thriller. Ah, ah, they thought it was a political thriller where one nation rises up against another and the teacher they followed was going to be an action hero, but they were wrong. There was a deeper story beneath the one they were living. They weren't in a political thriller. They were in an epic drama that had been unfolding since the beginning of time itself and through all the scriptures. The hero they had been interning with was not a worldly king who had come to kick Rome's butt. Rather, he was a heavenly king who had come to kick death's butt. I said butt two times on Easter. (laughs) You see, Jesus of Nazareth was working on a higher level. He came to earth not to lead a revolt or even reverse. He didn't come to earth to say a bunch of nice things. He came to show us what God was actually like. And in the ultimate demonstration of what God was actually like, he laid down his life, sacrificed himself, and then was victorious. In the mid-90s, some of you guys will remember the singer Joan Osborne put out a song. I don't know if she put out any other songs, but this was one on the radio. If God had a face, what would it look like? And would you want to see If seeing meant that you would have to believe in things like heaven and Jesus and the saints and all the prophets. And yeah, yeah, God is great. Yeah, yeah, God is good. Some of you are singing it right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on the bus 
trying to make his way home. I remember when this song came out and it was all over the radio and a lot of Christians were like, like upset by it. I'm like, why are you so upset? This is a phenomenal song. This is a song that people have been, people have been asking this question for millennia. What if God was actually one of us? What if he was like us? What if he was one of us? And the answer, friends, is that he was. He looked exactly like Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus showed us what God was like not only in his teachings, not only the way he rolled throughout his years of ministry, but he showed us what God was like most clearly by taking on our sorrows, our skin and bones, our heartache, our weariness, all the things that entered into our story and broke us, he took on, every one of them. And he went further, becoming the target of hatred and jealousy and unspeakable violence, even torture and execution. What is God like? He's like that. He takes on our pains. But instead of stopping there, he doesn't stop with empathy alone. Instead of stopping there, he goes a step further and he overcomes those things. He turned back the suffering. He turned back death. And he promised he would do the same thing for us one day. Friends, this was the story that made Cleopas and Garfield's eyes pop. They misunderstood. But now, now they saw the truth. Hope is not found in political leaders or new legislation. Those things can be very important, but there's never been a king or a Caesar or a president who held salvation in his hands, never. Hope is not found in political parties or social activism. Hope is not found in cancer research or autism funding, as wonderful as those things can be. Hope is not found in a better job or the right spouse or a secure retirement fund. It's not found in better education or a stronger military, in the price of gold, or even in the golden rule. Hope can never be found in any of those things because hope is a person. You want to break out of the shadows of death and despair? You don't need a new platitude. You certainly don't need a new senator who's going to fix that. You need someone there who actually entered into death and despair and defeated them both. This, friends, is why I follow Jesus of Nazareth. He has the best story. He has the best story. It's the story that makes sense of the beauty and the brokenness in my life, and it makes sense of my insatiable longing for shalom, that peace and a wholeness, and my belief that I, I'm actually going to get to taste it one day. Do you long to taste it as much as I do? Yeah. Oh, friends, this week marks the fifth anniversary of Janae McWilliams' death. Many of you knew her, and if you did, I'm sure you loved her. She had the biggest personality in all of Junction City. (laughs) Nobody will dispute that, I'm sure. And she also gave the biggest hugs. She was part of our family for 16 years as my not quite officially adopted sister. And in February of 2019, she was diagnosed with cancer and it moved very, very quickly. We didn't realize how quickly it had moved. In fact, five years ago today is when she was staying with us and Sarah took her to the hospital. That was a Monday. By Monday evening, she was in the ICU. By Wednesday, they realized to the extent to which the cancer had spread. By Thursday, they realized there was nothing they could do. And by early, early Saturday morning, she was gone. Quite a few of us were with her as we surrounded her bed and sang worship songs with her that Saturday evening, her last night on earth. I like to think we sang her straight to Jesus. Her death hit me really hard. I'll be honest, it hit me very hard. I had a lot of questions. I had a lot of anger. And, and in fact, behind closed doors in my own private world, it made me think about throwing in the towel on this Jesus thing. It really did. I didn't, I didn't talk openly about that. It scared me to death. I certainly didn't want you guys to know that. I didn't want to scare you guys as much as I was, you know? Because when doubt and pain and despair rush up on you like that, it's so paralyzing. 
It disoriented me for a few months. But it's been five years, and as you can see, I didn't walk away. You know why I didn't walk away? It wasn't because I got my questions answered. It certainly wasn't because I got my sister back. It was simply this. In the story of Jesus Christ, I found a context for my suffering. The story of Jesus makes sense of the beauty that we find in those that we love, even the beauty we found in Janae, for she was made in God's image and, 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 and in her over-the-top, lavish generosity and affection that everybody knew, we see a glimpse of God himself. It made sense of that, and it made sense of the brokenness that took her from us, for we really do have an enemy in this life. And the story of Jesus made sense of my, my own weird, insatiable longing for something completely irrational, and that's this to actually see her again. Isn't that weird that we have that longing? Like, I want to get another Janae hug, I'll be honest, and I'm not even a hugger. (laughs) How do I account for that silly longing that all the sad things could come untrue? Where all the things could be made new and made well? Where do we get that longing? I mean, maybe it's wishful thinking, maybe it's a weird psychological glitch. But it could also be true that there's a deeper, truer story behind what we can see. It could be that we, too, are part of something bigger than we ever dreamed. As C.S. Lewis suggested, it might be that the reason we feel these things that don't exist in this world is because we're meant for another world. A world where there is no cancer, where there is no war, where there is no heartbreak. Friends, even talking like this makes me wistful. I want to experience it, you know? And maybe you think that sounds deluded, and maybe I am deluded, but honestly, I think I'm just homesick. I think I'm just homesick for the world which I was created for, where brokenness and grief are hazy memories, and where we will one day dine together around the tables in a garden alongside the one who conquered death on our behalf. Here's the thing, I actually believe it. I believe this is true. I've gone all in on the story of Jesus Christ, despite my weakness, maybe because of my weakness. I've gone all in in the story of Jesus Christ, that he came to lay down his life for us, to show us how great How deep, how wide is God's love for us? And then proceeded to rescue us from all the things that break us, our own selfishness, oppression, and even death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would have life that goes on and on and on. You see what I mean? He has the best story. A story that says behind all the beauty and beneath all the pain is a forever kind of hope. And it rests on one man, the one man who who, who defied death and prepares a place for us now. Jesus Christ. He is risen. Let's stand together.